Judge Kelly, Judge Morris, Judge Lucas, good morning. My name is Andrew Crawford. I'm here on behalf of the appellant in this case, Ricky Carls. Judge Kelly, I'd respectfully reserve five minutes for rebuttal. The major issue in this case is whether or not the trial court improperly excluded a defense witness, in this case, the defendant's mother. As the court knows, every citizen in the state has a Sixth Amendment and Fourteenth Amendment federal right and a Article I, Section 9, Section 16 right of the Florida Constitution to present all witnesses on their behalf. Mr. Crawford, um, while your position is that the mother was wrongfully excluded, give me an example of a witness that would be appropriately excluded. In other words, what criteria must there be for a judge clearly to exclude a witness? An example of a judge excluding a witness most frequently in criminal cases were, say, if I were to call a polygraph examiner to say that a defendant passed a polygraph test is the best example that I can give. Because the ultimate function of credibility is for the jury and a polygrapher cannot give his or her opinion on the truthfulness of a witness since that's the function of the jury. Well, uh, Judge McKeighton in this case uh, basically said because this incident occurred at 9.30 and the last time she saw her son was at 9 o'clock, she couldn't testify as to anything that happened in the intervening 30 minutes and therefore her testimony was irrelevant. Is that basically what she said? Have I got that right? That's exactly what she said, Judge Morris. Okay. So, I mean, if she can't, if she didn't see him and, and, and didn't watch him to see whether he ingested alcohol or drugs 30 minutes before the incident, why would it be relevant what her testimony would have been? It's absolutely relevant. In a DUI case, there's two elements. Number one, that the defendant was driving. And number two, the defendant was driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs, in this case drugs, to the extent his normal faculties were impaired. In this case, you don't have any type of alcohol. You have controlled substances. And the state's expert witness, a forensic toxicologist, could not pin down not only the quantity or the time that those substances were taken. What Ms. Carls would have testified to was she was home with her son. He did not take controlled substances. She controls his prescriptions, and he was not intoxicated when he left that evening. Whether or not she personally observed him 30 minutes or not before the accident is completely goes to the weight of his evidence as opposed to the admissibility. The courts of the state have made it expressly clear that excluding a witness should be rarely done in only the most extreme circumstances. That's especially so in a criminal case where you have both a state and federal constitutional right to present a witness. In this case, to say that she did not observe her son 30 minutes before the accident, again, goes to the weight of the evidence, not its admissibility, especially when you have a forensic toxicologist testifying for the state that the substances detected in the defendant's urine, which were neither quantified nor specifically said when those could have been taken up to 24 hours prior to the accident. Her testimony was especially helpful in this particular case because it could have shed light on the defendant's defense that he was not under the influence of the controlled substances to the extent his normal faculties were impaired. Now, you've read the attorney general's brief and they have said, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But the evidence in this case was overwhelming as your client. And therefore, the exclusion of this witness is harmless. It wouldn't have added anything because the evidence was overwhelming. What do you say to that? I say that every defendant in the state of Florida is entitled to a fair shake and a fair trial, regardless of what the evidence is. And implicit in that right is the right to present witnesses on your own behalf. I would also point out to the case that I cited in my reply brief from the First District Court of Appeal, harmless error is not sufficiency of the evidence, whether there was overwhelming evidence, really the determination is how would this have affected the case? You would have heard from an independent witness, the defendant's mother, who would have testified contrary to each and every one of the state's witnesses and would have confirmed his defense. 
Well, I mean, I guess would would she have? I mean, because really her testimony was she was they were in the same house, putting aside the 30 minute block that Judge Morris was talking about. They were in in the same house. She wasn't she didn't testify that she watched him every moment, every minute, every half hour, every hour. They were just in the same general area. You've got the toxicology. I mean, he voluntarily consented to a urine test and he gets he gets up with Xanax, cocaine, Valium from the coca ethylene looks like alcohol. Um, we've got an eyewitness that testifies that there's a parked white car. She easily saw it. He didn't. He goes careening into it. You've got um, you've got his kind of incoherent responses after being taken into custody. I mean, there's a lot of evidence of his being impaired at the time of his driving and the mothers, if, even if we assume that it was some kind of error to exclude Mrs. Carl's testimony, it's not even that contradictory to that evidence. It's just, I was in the house while I was in the house. I didn't see him ingest these, these chemicals. Well, Judge, the, I guess like, Hey, it's just echoing judge Morris's point. Like what is, is there really harmful error here? There is harmful error. Because it's not, although it is, the standard of review is a abuse of discretion as it relates to the admission of evidence or not, mm -hmm. it's a heightened standard of review in this case, because you're involving state and federal constitutional rights. Furthermore, yes, there was that evidence, but really what it comes down to is did Mr. Carl's receive due process and was the evidence that was excluded improperly. Now, I will concede that the proffer here is not the best proffer, and we have to glean her her testimony from the record. But the law also makes it clear that an attorney can provide a summary of her evidence, which this the defense attorney did in this case, specifically on page 279 through 285 of the record. Uh, also, I would, would direct your honors to page 380 and 381 of the record, where Ms. Carls does testify a little bit at sentencing and says she would have never let him left if he was intoxicated. Now, again, Judge Lucas, yes, there is the state's evidence, but really what we have here is someone being deprived of a constitutional right to call all witnesses on their own behalf. That is a very significant right, which we all have, and the courts of the state have made it expressly clear that a trial judge should almost never do that except in the most extreme and compelling circumstances. And the only evidence we have here of that is that the judge determined that because Ms. Carls did not observe her son 30 minutes before the accident, her testimony was irrelevant. Now, her testimony of whether that was relevant or not is a direct interpretation of the of the Florida Evidence Code, which I would submit to this court, is a de novo standard of review because it determines the law itself. Her, te her testimony was expressly relevant in this case because it would have cast doubt on the state's evidence. And I would say that this evidence is contradictory because Really, the question is whether or not he was under the influence of a controlled substance. The evidence that we have of that is a urine test that is not quantified, so we don't know how much. We also, from the forensic toxicologist, said she couldn't testify that he was under the influence of the substances actually at the time of the accident. All she could say were these, these substances were in the defendant's urine for a specified period of time. It's not a situation where we have a, a breathalyzer where a defendant takes a breathalyzer and you know right then and there that they're under the influence of alcohol. It's much different. We have a, the state's expert saying that some of these substances could have been in his his system for up to seven days prior to the accident. Many Mr. of Crawford, them. I, you know, Mr. Crawford, I don't mean to cut you off, but I, I don't want to get you too far away from your other issues because you're going to run out of time. Yes, sir. I want to jump over the improper impeachment with the prior convictions. That's pretty cut and dried. I think, issue. I want to move to the fundamental error uh, when the trial court departed from a neutral role and repeatedly chastised defense counsel. Would you speak to that? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, in this particular case, it started in jury selection. Um, we have the trial judge here 
not allowing defense counsel to use the restroom after the state had gone for an hour and a half during jury selection. It proceeds forward throughout the entire trial, I would submit, where she cuts off counsel's questions, she interrupts counsel, there are times when she chastises him in front of the jury, um, she accuses defense counsel of manipulating the proceedings during jury selection, and in this particular case, I would submit to this court, departed from her neutral role and seemed to favor the prosecution based on the record we have before the court. There were additionally times when counsel would ask to approach um, to clarify an objection and the court would refuse to do so. Based on the totality of the entire trial, I would submit that this rises to the level of fundamental error. I would submit we don't have a, a situation where a judge is actively questioning witnesses. However, based on the record before the court, Judge Morris, if the court is going to reverse and remand, I would ask the court to reverse and remand for a new trial before a different trial judge based on the judge's bias that she displayed in this case. Unlike the state, where the state says that this judge was particularly cognizant on trying to respect the defendant's rights, I look at it differently. And I think the record reveals something completely different, which started with jury selection when the judge makes certain comments like, come on, man. And again, accuses defense counsel of trying to manipulate the proceedings, trying to pre-try the case. While I understand that a trial judge is, is clearly afforded the, the right to control the mode of, of evidence and the preparation of evidence, you can't treat a defense attorney like this, especially in front of the jury. And Judge Lucas and Judge Morris being trial judges formally, this is not something that a trial judge can or should do. And she did in this case. Um, it's very clear that the judge wanted this case done in one day. She did not want to go any further. Therefore, she didn't want to take any particular breaks, for example, a bathroom break to afford to defense counsel. And Judge Morris, do you have any other questions on that point? Not on that point, but I want to shift to venue now. Yes. Okay? Venue, of course, is something every prosecutor fears they're going to forget because it's an incidental thing in a trial. And as a former prosecutor, I always wrote down on a sheet of paper, don't forget to prove venue, because I knew I was going to forget it because you get caught up in the bigger issues. But wasn't there enough here? You talked about, you know, uh, Pinellas County cruisers and things like that. And you talked about a safety harbor. And and there enough here to prove venue? And, and, and not proving venue is fatal. So, I mean, I, I, I understand that. But I think there's enough here. What do you think? Based on the record before the court and the case law that I cited within the initial brief, I would submit that there's not enough here. Proving venue is a simple thing. Did you, officer, deputy, did this occur within Pinellas County, Florida? Yes, that didn't happen in this case. True, venue is not required to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, unlike the elements of the crime. However, it is a element the state is still required to prove. Um, there were references to Safety Harbor, there were references to a particular, excuse me, highway within Safety Harbor, which is in Pinellas County, Florida, but based on the case law, I'd submit there's not enough here. And I'd ask the court to grant a judgment of acquittal on that basis. And Judge Kelly, I believe you had a question that I was unable to address. Yeah, I did. I want to go back to, um, you were talking about the lack of evidence of impairment, but you did have his conduct. I mean, you, 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 you were listing all the other things that were, could be ambiguous, but his conduct was not ambiguous, arguably. And in, in looking at this and as whether or not the error would be harm, harmful or not, um, you know, you talked about his mom coming in. In, in reviewing that, can we talk, can we consider the fact, well, well, it's his mother. Of course, she's going to say that. I mean, is that a, an appropriate frame of reference for us in evaluating the harmfulness? No, I think that's a question for the jury. I think that's ultimately a jury question. And although the jury instructions say that 
DUIs has two elements. It's really three. Driving or actual physical control under the influence of alcohol or controlled substances. And then the third issue is to the extent his normal faculties were impaired. And really what, what Ms. Carl's testimony is crucial to is I would concede element number two, which is the controlled substances. His observ the, the observations really go to under the influence. And one of the questions here was whether or not he was under the influence of controlled substances. And the only thing that the toxicologist could say was these things were taken either 12 or seven to, to 24 hours prior to the accident itself. So his mom's testimony would not only speak to, to that, but would also speak to whether or not he was under the influence. So it goes to both elements, not just one. All right. And you're at your uh, five minute mark. You want to I save would... that five minutes? If I may, please. All righty. Good morning, everyone. May it please the court. My name is Nicole Smith. I'm appearing on behalf of the Appalee, the state of Florida. Uh, Judge Lucas and Judge Morris, you essentially took my argument. You perfectly summarized all the evidence, the overwhelming evidence that was presented in this case. So I'm just going to dive right into the first issue. The trial court excluded the appellant's mother from testifying because her testimony was not relevant. And the this problem with this counsel, though, that is an extremely rare thing to do. And as a former trial judge, you just don't take someone's witness away. You just don't. There's got to be a really overwhelming reason to do it. I just don't see it here. The reason is. If you look at the rules of evidence under Rule 401, it defines relevant evidence. And relevant evidence is evidence that tends to prove or disprove a material fact. The That's material sustaining an objection, though, and I get that. This is precluding a, a key witness who was present with him just before the incident from testifying at all. It's the state's position that she was not a key witness. In this case, we had her proffered testimony. This is not like some of the cases that were cited in the initial brief where the judge did not even take the proffered testimony. We knew exactly what her testimony was and her and she was not a key witness. She did not remember what time appellant arrived home. She was not asked, nor did she definitively say whether or not she observed him consume any controlled substances. She did not say whether or not he had prescriptions for some of the legal substances that were found in his system. But she was able to testify as to his demeanor, though, wasn't she? Did she did not testify as to his demeanor. She was not asked. And she did not testify as to his demeanor. She I thought she testified something to the effect of she wouldn't have let him go out. That was during her impact statement as sentencing. Okay. During her proffered testimony, it was one page long. She couldn't remember what time he arrived home. She said it was still light outside. She was specifically asked, were you home with, did you, did you see appellant the entire time? She said, I was home with him the entire time. But isn't this all testimony for a jury to weigh? This isn't for a judge to basically act as a jury and, and, and weigh this and discard this, this, this very, to, to me, a witness who's testifying about how he was just before the incident is very key. And for a judge to say, nah, we're not going to hear it, is basically depriving the jury of its ability to weigh this testimony, consider the credibility of the witness, as every judge instructs the juries to do at the end of a trial. I mean, it, it seems pretty extreme what happened here. I agree with you that if her testimony were key, that it would be improper to exclude it. But here, her testimony was not key. The, pro Even the problem is, is that you're focusing solely on relevancy under the rule, and there's an additional dynamic to this. If this were a civil case, we, we wouldn't be talking, we probably wouldn't even be talking about this. But this is a criminal case which implicates constitutional rights to call witnesses, which means that the way the case law is shaken out is as Judge Morris summarizes basically like, hey, when in doubt, let the let the defendant put on what witnesses they want. Um, 
I, I can't imagine what the prosecutor was thinking when they decided when they when they even made this an issue. I mean, just let let mom testify and shake it. And it shakes out the way it typically shakes out in these kinds of things, which is, well, it's his mom and she didn't watch him like a hawk the whole time and anything that happened. I, I, I really have a hard time imagining why the prosecutor wanted this witness precluded and why the trial judge excluded her. Well, the prosecutor wanted this witness excluded because it was their because they want because they want everybody excluded. Yeah, they don't want the defense. It was to their position. Witnesses. Sure, they want to win. It was their position that yeah. this testimony was not relevant and it did not it did not sway the verdict in any manner. Given the overwhelming you evidence, could, you could say that with assurance had that proffer been testimony before the jury, though, you know, and that's the problem is that we kind of got to work with this, this unknown variable like, well, would it have, would it maybe have nudged him just a little bit? I, I don't, we'll never know. And, and, but, and as the Supreme Court has, you know, reminded us and chastised us, it's not an overwhelming evidence test. I, I understand that, and I respectfully disagree. Given the overwhelming evidence, I understand your point. Uh, this particular, well, I'm this just reminding you and us that the yes. Supreme Court has said, don't think of it in terms of overwhelming evidence. They if, they 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 they've specifically chastised district courts that use that in their analysis of harmful error when we've referenced the overwhelming nature of the evidence it's and we're told it's not an overwhelming evidence test thank you for reminding us of that judge kelly i appreciate that i would still respectfully disagree and point to the line of cases where this type of testimony was excluded because this was not a key witness she was not a key witness and Unlike other cases where error was found, the trial judge didn't even proffer the testimony. They didn't even take the proffer testimony. Here, we knew exactly what she was going to say. Can I shift gears on you? Because I think we're kind of covering the same ground over and over again on this. I want to sure. shift gears and go to the improper impeachment of the defendant with the prior convictions. I mean, it's pretty cut and dried what you can do with these prior convictions. And it's pretty cut and dried that more was done than what you're allowed to do. Why don't you address that issue? So in this case, this, the state never impeached appellant with his prior convictions. If you look at the exact testimony, appellant testified on direct that he had prior convictions. He specifically admitted that he had a prior conviction of a crime involving dishonesty. On cross-examination, the state asked him again, do you have any prior convictions? He initially said no. And it was the state who asked, and in between that time, the state asked for a bench conference and appellant corrected himself and said, oh, yes. After the bench conference, the state never brought this up again. The state did not inquire into the underlying convictions. The state moved on. So the state never impeached him with his prior convictions. There was no proof of the underlying facts of any of those prior convictions. And because the appellant elected to testify in his own defense, the state properly referred to his credibility during closing argument. How would you like to have been the defense attorney in this trial with this judge? I think this judge was fair and impartial. I think the excuse me, the trial judge was showed deference to defense counsel. Going back to voir dire, jury selection. Defense counsel was not asking any questions. He was lecturing. He was going on tangents, discussing video replays during baseball games instead of asking the panel questions. And the trial judge has to keep reminding him, ask a question. What are you trying to get at? The trial judge even gave him suggestions. Ask the panel if they can be fair and impartial. When Apollo was testifying, he was providing non-responsive answers. The judge, outside of the presence of the jury, had to keep reminding the appellant, answer the question that specifically was asked. Defense counsel even asked the court if he could treat his client as a hostile witness. Otherwise, he's going to keep he's going to keep 
providing non-responsive answers. So it's the state's position that the record as a whole, and that's part of the reason why the state's answer brief is so lengthy, is because if you look at the record as a whole, instead of taking little small pieces of the transcript out of context, you will see that the trial judge in this case was fair and impartial throughout. She was definitely trying to get the case tried in a day. That, that came through loud and clear. She was. She was. But a trial judge's role is to be fair and impartial, and she never departed from her role. It's the state's position that she never departed from her role, and obviously, it's obvious to the state that she her actions and conduct, alleged conduct, did not rise to the level of fundamental error. The totality of the judge's actions in this case are nothing like those cases that were cited in the initial brief and which were cited to uh, distinguish in the answer brief. Nothing like Lang v. State. Nothing like this court's decision in Cagle v. State. Nothing like this court's decision in Lyles v. State, where, the, where this court and other district courts have found that the trial court's actions were improper. And again, there was overwhelming evidence. Even if the trial court departed from its neutral, there was overwhelming evidence of appellant's guilt. The jury saw video for themselves. They saw body camera video. They saw video of appellant sleeping in the back of the patrol vehicle and then awakening, appearing confused. He asked where he was. He didn't know what happened when he was told he was involved in a DUI crash. He asked if his truck was okay. And if there's no other questions, I'll move on to the fourth issue, with, which is venue. Venue must be proved by preponderance of the evidence. And here there was ample testimony and it was ample references to the Philippi Parkway, Safety Harbor, Mullet Creek Park, where he performed the field sobriety exercises. It's clear that the jury who are Pinellas County residents could have reasonably inferred that the offense occurred in Pinellas County. There might, there might be more than one Mullet Creek Park out there. There could be there could be more than one in Florida. <laughs> That's possible, but when, but when you factor that in with the Philippi Parkway safety yeah. harbor transported to Mee's Countryside Hospital, he was in Pinellas County. So unless the court has any questions or seeks further clarification on a particular issue raised, the state will rely on the arguments set forth in the answer brief and respectfully ask this court to affirm appellate's conviction and sentence. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Crawford, you've got your five minutes. Again, as I mentioned during the initial part of my argument, we don't have the best proffer here, but what we do have, what the question is, is can this court glean from the record what Ms. Crawls would have testified to? Um, the law is clear and the case law is clear that the court can consider representations of counsel. On page 279 of the trial record, counsel represented that Ms. Crawls would have testified that Mr. Mr. Crawls, the defendant, did not take any su controlled substances before he left. Um, he also mentions that he wanted Ms. Crawls to testify of the observations of the defendant before he left. And there's a there's a specific portion on page 318 of the transcript where the state is cross-examining the defendant. And the state brings up that whether or not Mr. Carls had controlled prescriptions for this. And Mrs. Mrs. Carls, I would submit, could, could testify that he does have prescripts for it and actually said that she had pictures of the script in her purse. Going to the, the sentencing hearing, Ms. Carls testified on page 380 and 381 of the record, specifically that she didn't think he was under the influence, and if she did, she wouldn't have let him drive. I would submit that's sufficient. Again, Judge Kelly, as you noted, it's not a overwhelming evidence test. Um, and as Judge Lucas mentioned, we're talking about serious constitutional rights at the federal and state level, which were completely ignored. The only way you can exclude a defense witness is if there's overwhelming prejudice, for example, the person, the, the defense counsel did not list the witness until the day of trial. And even then you're very, very 
rarely supposed to do that. And you're only supposed to do it under the com most compelling of circumstances, which we certainly did not have here. This was a relevant key witness and the only witness who could have testified in addition to the defendant in this case for the defense. The witness was properly listed and the trial judge excluded this witness based on an or tennis motion without a written motion, without any type of argument held before trial. Uh, that is a serious constitutional error. It is not a harmless error. And it asks the court to reverse and remand on that point alone. I respectfully disagree with the opposing counsel that the trial judge demonstrated a special deference to the defense attorney in this case. That's not what I read in the transcript. What's clear in the transcript, as Judge Lucas mentioned, is she wanted this trial done in a day. She wanted certain things asked in a certain way. She cut off questioning. And I'd submit she was very disrespectful to defense counsel. I'd ask the court, if the court is going to reverse and remand on any of the issues, to please reverse and remand for a new trial before a different and unbiased judge. If there's any follow-up questions, again, I'd respectfully ask this court to reverse and remand for a new trial. And I would stand on all the points I raised in my initial and reply brief, unless there's any other questions from any of the court members. Thank you. I think we're good. Thank you both. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank nice you. job, everybody. <clears throat> okay, our next case this morning is Hammer versus the Standard Fire Insurance Company. <laughs>